We're here to talk about lawns, one of those habitats that if managed badly are really bad for bees but can be managed well for bees. Well the history of lawns in it goes back nearly 900 years. They began to develop in, in, in Western Europe. Wealthy people began to want to have lawns within their castles or next to their castles. Lawns were actually almost a demonstration of, of wealth and power, showing that you didn't need to grow food on all your land and you had hundreds of servants or slaves to cut that fine crop grass. When I came to Stonehouse over 20 years ago, this lawn was incredibly short cropped, it had got no flowers in it and it even had keep off the grass signs in it. But now the owners are beginning to think about things differently. We've got clovers in here, we've got bees feeding on it and it's a brilliant example of what hotels can do today. One man from Stroud, Edwin Beard Budding, invented the lawnmower. And here it is, one of the original lawnmowers. You can see it, anybody can see it. Museum in the park in Stroud. Edwin was an engineer in the cloth factories and he saw a machine that was used for napping the cloth and getting it nice and smooth. And he saw it had a blade just like this. And he had this idea that it could be used to cut lawns. And apparently he built the first ones in secret and even tested the first ones at night because people thought he might be crazy. But this machine completely transformed lawn care. You may ask, what has this got to do with bee conservation? What does this machine have to do with the survival of the planet? Well, firstly, bees are really important and they're really important for pollination. It's said that if bees died out, human beings were probably only four or five years to live unless we could find another way of pollinating many of the plants we require food. Short crop lawns with no wildflowers are really bad for bees but letting the plants grow, letting clovers grow, letting other plants grow is really good for bee conservation. So the question is, is did the invention of the lawnmower pose a threat to bees? I'm not saying that lawns per se are bad because tightly cut lawns for playing bowls on or tennis or cricket are wonderful things. But what the great concern of the threat to bees are, are the vast expanses of lawns that aren't used for anything, that no children play on, you don't have picnics on, and particularly those lawns that have keep off the grass signs. So in these modern times, we need to think about what the purpose of our lawn is. Lawns should be for fun, to play on, to actually have picnics on. But where you've got grass that you don't need to do that, there's a real opportunity to actually make them more environmentally friendly, make them good for bees. So you can have fun on them and they're really good for some of our declining pollinators. So we come down here at uh, the bottom of Bisley Road in Stroud to uh, just a regular garden here just to actually find out a bit more about what you can do when your, your garden, the small patch of grass, what you can do for conservation and what you can do for bees. So we're here with Gareth. Um, tell us a bit about your, your lawn. What, what have you got here? It's looking great. Well, when I inherited it, it was much like many lawns. It was a very tightly mown bit of grass and I thought, that's really boring, I want to see a bit more wildlife. So essentially, I just stopped doing anything. Um, <laughs> so you actually literally stopped cutting it? Yeah, stopped cutting it um, and started to man manage it like a hay. The great thing about a hay meadow is that you only cut it once a year, which is fantastic. So um, you, literally, so yeah. just, just, just to check, you just cut your lawn once a year? Cut once a year, probably about mid-July, I get the scythe out, just saw what came up. Um, there's a little bit of seeding went in, but essentially we found red clover came up really quickly. We had wild carrot, that's, that's red clover there, yeah. yeah. Um, and then as soon as we got the, the habitat starting to improve, we started to get lots of bees, pollinators, hoverflies, damselflies, butterflies come in, and it feels like a right haven all of my home now. So it looks like you've actually got sort of a spring watch meadow in your back garden already. It is, it's amazing. So and. Lots of people here would have to go out to nature reserves um, and to triple size and things like that. Well, I can just come up to the garden and enjoy all of that. And what about your, your neighbours? Uh, do you get people looking over the garden fence thinking that you're sort of, you know, you, you're doing something wrong or, or what have you? Well, it's funny because I, I, actually most of our neighbours are quite supportive, but one of them um, kept piping their head over the wall and saying, um, do you want us to help you mow the lawn? <laughs> <laughs> but they thought we were sort of too busy and too rushed off our feet. So no, it's meant to be like that. And I think as it's come up and more of the flowers have come up, it's sort of, oh, that's actually quite a good idea. Yeah. 
so I'm still working on them. That's brilliant. So you've actually got, you've actually got a wildlife haven. It provides a, a sitting area and area so you can actually enjoy your lawn. Yeah. And it's a lot less work. Yep, and it's feeding my neighbour's bees. <laughs> it's feeding your neighbour's bees. That's brilliant. <laughs> I'm Paul Sargent, I'm Ecotricity's online community manager. And we're here in Stroud uh, in the Woolbridge area and we're going to go on a lunchtime safari. We're going to head over there in a second and see if we can find some bees and then we'll have a walk down by the river and see if we can see any more bees or butterflies. Some kind of coprinous species, so uh, an ink cap, I think. It's time to get muddy knees. Looks like a female looking for a home. And I think it's checking out potential nesting sites so it can dig itself a nest and start stocking up with food and laying eggs. I think that's a male hairy-footed flower bee based on the speed it's flying at. It kind of looks like a bumblebee, but it's not. Jelly ear usually grows on elder, which I think this is. It's really common though, you see it everywhere. Um, it's, a, it's a bee fly. They're kleptoparasites of solitary bees. You normally see them kind of hovering over holes and they, they flick their eggs into the holes from like a distance of about three or four inches. It's a comma, I think. Let's get this one though. It's pretty well disguised as an ivy leaf. That's amazing, actually. I think it's a lazy glossum, um, or they call them sweat bees. They're one of the, the mining bees that actually can deliver a painful sting, but I've never, I've never been bothered by one. fungi down here. They're looking a bit crispy, turkey tail type bracket. Um, they're kind of, the, they're related to the ones that we saw on the, on the grass earlier. Some more fungi, trametes, turkey tail type. It's amazing what you can see when you go looking. So in an hour, we saw two different species of butterfly. We saw comma and a brimstone. We saw loads of mining bees as well, looking for somewhere to make a home. And we saw quite a few fungi, actually. We saw the jelly ear, some ink caps, and a few mystery ones that I need to investigate. Thanks for coming along on the lunchtime safari. We're here at uh, the field at Lynch Knoll, owned by Ecotricity, and it's a field that's not been grazed for over 20 years. What, we, what we're doing today is that we're taking away, we're creating areas of bare ground, we're taking away the dominant species and putting back some of the native species that would 
have naturally occurred here before this field was used for intensive farming. This is a field that was in an intensive grassland and it's been left by electricity, occasionally cut um, to actually allow nature to return. So today we've got a group of electricity staff uh, giving up their time to actually act as, uh, as sort of uh, artificial cows that were scraping away some of, some of this material. They're scraping the, the thatch, the deep thatch into piles and we're going to move that away um, off site to actually again stripping the nutrients out of, out of the soil and then later this afternoon they'll be sprinkling wild seed and stamping it in. They're all doing their little area so hopefully they'll come back next summer and see the benefits of their work. So I hope you've enjoyed this short story of the lawn, going back from the Middle Ages through the massive houses to the lawnmower to the present day and coming here into Gareth Lawn to actually see what you can do um, with your lawn, which actually requires less work. You can actually create a wildlife haven in your garden um, by only cutting it perhaps once a year and producing these wonderful flowers great for bees. You don't have to do all of your lawn, you can have an area that's great for sitting around and having barbecues, but there's a real opportunity to create a wildlife haven in your garden and help bees who are in dramatic decline. <laughs>